What's up, peers? My name is Max Hillebrand, and I welcome you to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Uh, today, we are going to the moon with a lightning powered rocket together with Isvan Sheres, who is a researcher based in Budapest, uh, both working on Wasabi, but also doing some uh, very groundbreaking research uh, and education in the privacy aspects of the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And that is the topic of today's conversation. And I'm telling you, it's a dense one because, well, Bitcoin is already complex enough. Adding another layer on top makes it quite a lot more complex, especially when we want to consider all the privacy trade-offs and possible attack vectors uh, that come with such a Lightning Network. Uh, so we talk about, you know, the on-chain privacy related to that, as, or specifically, how can you uh, prevent other people from finding out uh, which payment channels you have just by watching the Bitcoin blockchain itself. But of course, the attack vectors go much further than this, as we also uh, will be talking about uh, the threat of uh, attackers finding out payment correlations when the payments are routed through the night Lightning Network. Uh, both when the attacker is on the uh, in the route itself or just a bystanding observer. Um, but Pierce, in any case, this is really a golden conversation worth to listen to if you are interested on how you can already now optimize your Bitcoin privacy on the Lightning Network if you take a couple uh, important steps, uh, like, of course, coin joining um, and uh, many other small nuances. Uh, but this is also interesting if you want to be part in developing that next generation of a more privacy-focused Lightning Network, uh, because, oh boy, we have a lot of work still to do. So without any further ado, let's get into this conversation with Istvan Sheres about the Bitcoin Lightning Network privacy. And as always, don't forget to like the videos, as this really helps the show, and of course, to share it with the peers whom you think would be interested to join the Wasabi Cast. So Istvan, you're one of the, the great researchers here in the Bitcoin privacy space, and you have recently tinkered a lot on Lightning Network privacy, uh, and I am just absolutely excited to get to talk to you finally on record uh, and explore all these different trade-offs uh, that we are struggling with in, in the Bitcoin Lightning Network and how to improve them. And so I, th I think it's going to be a fabulous conversation. But before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, Istvan, like, how did you actually in the first place get into cryptography and, and this mathematics branch? Uh, thanks for having me in the show, first of all. Um, well, I, I did my bachelor in mathematics and then um, I always liked discrete mathematics and number theory and all this kind of stuff. And then just gradually, year by year, um, I was more excited about uh, discrete maths, graph theory, number theory. And then I just found myself doing a master in Germany, in Saarbrücken, in cryptography. And then there was a really nice course on cryptocurrencies. And then the rest is history. I fell in love with uh, Bitcoin and cryptography. So, and now I'm doing a PhD in in privacy concerns, privacy enhancing techniques and cryptocurrencies. So that's also where my interest comes from in Lightning Network and the privacy issues of Lightning Network. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of uh, personal interest and motivation about this topic. Um, because like Lightning is super interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Uh, so it's really interesting. Um, for cryptographers, it's, interesting for network scientists, for graph theorists, because lightning is inherently a graph. So it's a really complex topic. And also, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm just fascinated by it. And uh, yeah, that that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm super excited to learn about lightning and privacy, because it's just a super colorful area. Like two years ago, when I started to look at lightning, um, it was 20... 19 January, if I remember correctly, it was, it almost felt like a virgin area, but it's not the case anymore. And, uh, so we can maybe review some of the recent results and, and, um, and attacks and, and countermeasures. Um, because also one of the reasons I, I, I personally really like lightning, uh, and, and I feel responsible for it 
is that there are so many misconceptions about the privacy guarantees of Lightning. And so maybe a, a podcast is a good place for a general audience, not just academic people, to get uh, more knowledgeable in the trade-off space and uh, privacy issues. Because, you know, whenever you just see people on Twitter, like saying, ah, oh, Lightning is fully private. I mean, I just don't have the time to talk to every people and, uh, and respond back to them that, hey, this is not the case. So maybe a podcast is a good place to start. And also, we are writing a chapter with Sergei Tikomirov and Carla Kirkohan in the Mastering Lightning book. So if you, if you are planning to purchase the book, then there will be a chapter on security and privacy of the Lightning Network written by the three of us. And uh, also the editors made some nice work on it. Hopefully it will make to the press. And then that will be also serve, I think, as a good place to get more knowledgeable around the security and privacy issues of Lightning. So, yeah, that's the long answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, really nice. Because I think you, you hit down here on the topic, right? That lightning, I mean, Bitcoin already is incredibly complex and multifaceted. Uh, lightning network seems to be even more so, right? Um, and m maybe just to, to kind of narrow down the complexity, at least to start out with. Um, although we have talked in, at this show already a bit about lightning network, how would you kind of summarize what lightning network is, is actually about on a conceptual layer? Um, so, Lightning is um, the one and only scalable solution for Bitcoin, which is non-custodial. So this is a super important property. So we want to scale Bitcoin in a non-custodial way. But also, um, even maybe even more importantly, at the end of the day, we want to preserve privacy. Um, so Lightning is a layer on top of Bitcoin, which uh, presumably provides both of these um, of these properties so scalability and privacy uh, and security uh, yeah so for me uh, this is lightning aha uh -huh. okay uh, so kind of the, the trying to find that niche of a scalable and private solution right, which uh, might actually be a bit counterintuitive because you know previously specifically with on-chain uh, privacy and there are a lot of efforts into something like ring signatures or confidential transactions which enhance the cryptography used uh, in, in that blockchain system, but end up putting a lot more complex information on the blockchain itself, right? which leads to less scalability because verifying such zero-knowledge proofs is more expensive. Right? So the, the idea of the Lightning Network is to rather remove information from the blockchain entirely right? and to, to make payments off-chain so that there is less of a track uh, on the blockchain itself. Now, where do you see that trade-off between these two different models? Yeah, and this is exactly the source of most of the people's misconception because, like, if you read some CoinDesk or Coin Telegraph or other blog posts, like from two or three years ago, this was exactly one of the privacy arguments that, okay, so we remove a lot of information, we don't broadcast many transactions on chain, so this surely improves privacy. Like, this was the common argumentation around the ecosystem. Uh, so my stance on this is that um, the reason I said that Lightning is the only way is um, exactly because what you said, that um, it, it seems really unlikely that we will have um, ring signatures or uh, other more advanced cryptographic machinery like ZK Snarks or ZK Starks or other zero knowledge proofs. So it will, it is pretty unlikely as of 2021, March 12th, that we will, we, we will be able to verify zero knowledge proofs on chain, on the Bitcoin chain. So basically this leaves us with only with Lightning Network. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of the only way we, we, we can or we uh, should scale Bitcoin. Um, so we will not have anything like ZK rollups or all this uh, fancy stuff, which other blockchains might use or not. Uh, so yeah, um, we need to go with Lightning, as it seems, uh, because we will not have other cryptographic tools on chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, as, as we said there, with Lightning you can remove some information off the chain, but you're not completely floating out there, right? You're always anchored back on the public Bitcoin blockchain. 
So can you speak a bit about, uh, you know, what type of transactions are actually still on the Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah. So, so Lightning is a, is a layer on top of Bitcoin. So whenever we talk about privacy, obviously we need to see, um, these two layers, um, simultaneously because uh, it just doesn't make sense because i mean an adversary will be present on both layers for sure so you can think of your favorite and three letter agency <laughs> kgb nsa whatever <clears throat> so obviously lightning um requires two on-chain transactions so first you need to open a payment channel with your peer or peers uh, that's an opening channel transaction that happens on chain so it is an on-chain footprint that costs a transaction, an on-chain transaction. And once, once the payment channel is open, then you can, um, send transaction back and forth, uh, between you and your peer. And then if you, if this channel is depleted or your business, uh, connection or a business relationship is over, then you can say, okay, um, I had enough ice cream. I had enough pizza. Uh, I want to close this payment channel. And then also this channel closing transaction goes to the um, Bitcoin mainnet. So you can have as many transactions as you want, but still two transactions will be visible on the Bitcoin um, mainnet. But even so, um, uh, so whenever we talk about privacy, we need to, uh, I cannot stress enough that we need to consider uh, an adversary uh, that is present on both layers. So the adversary will surely do some uh, uh, transaction graph analysis in the first place uh, to to assess and to see where the channel was opened and closed and how it was closed, and then at the adversary is surely present also on on, on Lightning. So uh, so this is th that's the reason why this argumentation is uh, completely flawed that uh, we move off chain so. The transactions are not visible on the public ledger on the blockchain, so we we are fine. Um, this is not the case because uh, why this is a permissionless um, network, financial network. So obviously anyone can just fire up a Lightning net node and just listen what's going on and and record everything what they hear on the uh, on the gossip layer on on the public channel layer. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, right, it always depends who the adversary is. And I think we have a lot more to talk about in, in this in just a second, but I, I want to hone down on, on one different uh, type of on-chain transaction that can be done specifically when closing a Lightning Network channel. Right? Because here we have, um, uh, you know, cooperative closes, uncooperative closes, and then even, you know, unjust closes. Um, can you kind of go before each of them through how the on-chain footprint looks like? Yeah, sure. So I don't think we need to really go into the details, but from a privacy perspective, what's important, I think, at least if we look, look ahead is that cooperative closing is nice because whenever we will have taproot, it will be, um, indistinguishable from any, uh, any other transaction, basically. But if, we will have uncooperative uh, channel closings. Then it's it's suboptimal from a privacy perspective because then it will be distinguishable from other taproot uh, public keys. Or, or maybe I'm not sure if this is the uh, or, or this is the right level of abstraction you want me to go into. But I think uh, from a privacy standpoint, this is the main um, distinction that um, cooperative uh, channel closing is good. From privacy perspective, if we have taproot and uncooperative is, is somewhat suboptimal because uh, people will know. Um, so whoever will have the blockchain uh, and many thousands of nodes have it already um, across the globe, then they will see that, hey, here, uh, uncooperative channel closing has just occurred. Uh, yes, in general, you're right. Uh, the the cooperative close is, is usually reveals less information uh, uh, because well, both parties agree and they can you know fine tune what exactly they reveal. Um, but I think even with Taproot, uh, because of the use of point time lock contracts, um, we at least get rid of the hash pre image, um, which usually was that fingerprint for 
uh, the uncooperative clause. So in a taproot world, it's even the corporate uncooperative channel clauses, I think, gain a little bit in privacy, although not that substantially. Um, but yeah, but yes, we, we're probably getting off in the weeds here a bit. So let's quickly holler back and talk about threat models, uh, because I think that's important in every privacy analysis. So what are different potential attackers uh, that we should defend against? Yeah, so, um, I mean, obviously, or hopefully the viewers uh, of this YouTube channel is already familiar with all these nice videos um, you have just made. and so. I suppose that the viewers are really well, well aware of the on-chain privacy hurdles and difficulties. So now you should take this amount of difficulty and hurdles and raise it to square. Um, and th this is because uh, we have multiple layers. So in the on-chain case, usually we consider an adversary who has access to the distributed ledger, to the blockchain, so obviously sees every transaction. Um, and in, in a more evolved case, we also assume that the adversary can also hear what's going on on the network layer. So you can imagine that uh, it's already pretty de devastating if the adversary can link. Uh, if you don't use, for example, Tor, then the adversary can link your IP address to the Bitcoin transaction you just broadcasted. So this is the on-chain adversarial model. So the adversary hears everything on the network layer and also sees the public ledger. And in, in the lightning case, we assume that the adversary is, is inside the network, uh, meaning that the adversary who wants to de-anonymize us has many open payment channels with, with many other nodes in the network. So it's well embedded into the lightning graph and has many uh, payment channels open with many other peers. So most likely whenever you want to route a payment, so Alice wants to route a payment to Bob, then they will route it through Cecile, Dave, Eve, Frederick, and so on. And we can assume that some of these intermediaries are controlled by the adversary. So the adversary will log that I needed to, I needed to uh, route some payment here and there. So that's the model. So Lightning Network, uh, if we think of an adversary, then we think uh, that the adversary has many open payment channels with other peers and they log every information, every public information. Um, and then maybe later, uh, just in a second, we can go into the weeds, like what other capabilities the adversary has. But the most important is that the adversary can and have open payment channels with, with lots of nodes and has a lot of capacity. Yeah, and I think here is one interesting observation, right? Because there's a difference between uh, maybe a passive Lightning Network listener as an uh, adversary, right, who just listens to the, the messages that are broadcasted and gossiped through the Lightning Network nodes. Um, and the other type of attacker is one who actually opens payment channels and is part of the route. Now. There is one big difference here that this active aggressor basically needs uh, capital, right? He needs to have some Bitcoin to open payment channels with. Uh, how do you think that this uh, ought to be treated in the analysis? Like easily. So it's it's not really. So we always need to have a mind a powerful attacker. So and capital requirements are not so high in the Lightning Network. I, I don't know, like maybe a few thousand Bitcoins are locked. But even if you just have a a few dozens of Bitcoin and, and you just log them on Lightning, you can already be, you can already have a pretty substantial uh, position in the graph. So I, I don't think, um, like, and, and always, anyways, if you make any kind of security and or privacy analysis, then always you need to have in mind the most powerful uh, adversarial model. And this is surely in our case, if you have open payment channels with others with, with really heavy capacity on them. Uh, may, maybe as the next step, we could just first, um, describe what are the privacy guarantees one can aim for in the Lightning Network. And then we could discuss how these 
uh, privacy guarantees um, or provisions we want to achieve uh, can be violated by by this attacker. Oh yes, that's that's an interesting approach. Uh, so, what do we set out for? What is actually the goal of Lightning Privacy? Yeah, cool. So, like you know, if if you read some really simplistic article, then you can just or or just read some tweets, then you can just say arguments that oh, Ellen is, Lightning Network is fully private, and and uh, you know, privacy is never binary. It's not zero or one. We have privacy or we don't have privacy, and this is especially true for the Lightning Network because here we have many flavors of info oh ma- here we have many flavors of information um, that we want to protect um so um one of the papers which is really important and one of the works we need to definitely mention and i also encourage the viewers that t- have a look at the, the description of this video because we will have some interesting links to great works so if you want to read more about it then I highly encourage you to to have a look at all these nice papers. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It just reflects my knowledge, but uh, um, you can surely find more interesting and um, deep papers on, on the topic. So one of the papers which recently came out and was presented in the Financial Cryptography Conference 2021, um, a few, one or two years, uh, two weeks ago, sorry, uh, it's it's a work by George Kapos and Anya Piotrowska and others from UCL and Cornell. Um, and they identify basically four main privacy guarantees we want to achieve in the Lightning Network. So first, obviously, if you have a private channel, then uh, in Lightning, we can have public channels and private channels. So if Alice and Bob opens a public channel, then it's fine because all the network can use this channel for routing payments. But if they decide not to disclose the, the details of this payment channel, then this is classified as a private channel. And then no one else should be able to use this payment channel for routing unless they know the existence of this private payment channel. And, uh, some, some people say that approximately even 30% of the channels on the Lightning Network currently are private channels. So like first privacy guarantee we want is that if we have a private channel between Alice and Bob, then Alice and Bob wants this private channel to be secret. So not even the existence of this private channel should be should be known to anyone, right? And the second uh, privacy guarantee we want is third party balance secrecy. So in the Lightning Network, each uh, payment channel's capacity is known, is, is public knowledge, so we cannot hide that. Um, so if there's a payment channel between Alice and Bob, then the capacity of it is known. The capacity of a payment channel is basically the, the sum of the individual balances of Alice and Bob, all of the two parties corresponding to the payment channel. And obviously, this information is known to Alice and Bob, but this privacy requirement says, dictates, uh, or this is at least our desire, that we want the individual balances themselves to be hidden. So, okay, Alice and Bob knows their individual balances in the pi- payment channel, but we want this information to be hidden from other parties. So this was the second. The third uh, property we want, privacy property we want to achieve on the Lightning Network is on path relationship anonymity. So suppose Alice sends some payment to Bob and they route this payment through many intermediary nodes like Carol, Dave, Eve, Fred, uh, whatever. Um, so what we want is, for example, if we just pick a random intermediary, Dave, then Dave should not be able to tell when, who is the sender and the receiver of this payment, all right? So that would be pretty uh, devastating. So Dave should not be able to tell whether Carol is the sender of this transaction or Alice or one of Carol's neighbors. And similarly, Dave not, should, not, uh, should not be able to tell whether uh, Eve is the recipient of the payment or Bob. So... In, in Lightning, Lightning News 
Lightning uses onion routing. So every routing node only knows the predecessor and the subsequent nodes where they need to um, route the payment to. Um, so obviously, if there is one hop, then we cannot really do anything because then it's already obvious that who is the sender and the receiver. But also, all, also the information, the length of the payment path is unknown to intermediaries. So even if the payment has just one hop, the the payment router cannot know whether the payment has one or two or three hops. So whether they cannot be sure whether he or she is the only uh, routing node. So this is on path on path relationship anonymity and, and and later on we can go into more details about uh, each of these privacy guarantees but he, now i just want to define them and the fourth and the last one according to this paper is off path payment privacy so for example i am an observer i have many payment channels to to my friends uh, and i should not be able to tell uh, what's going on along payment that do not involve me as an intermediary. So if Alice sends a payment to Bob, uh, okay, there are some intermediaries, uh, Carol, Dave, and all all these nice guys. Um, but still, I should not be able to tell how much money went through along those payment routes, or even just the existence that the payment occurred along some routes. Uh, so again, these are the four privacy guarantees according to this paper. So hiding pri private channels, second, third party balance secrecy, third, on path relationship anonymity, and fourth, off path payment privacy. And then uh, now maybe we can go into uh, like what kind of attacks you can do on the Lightning Network once you establish many payment channels uh, and, and, and maybe even countermeasures or intuition why this is the case. Um, yeah, so we can go into this direction if you want. Yeah, those are four really interesting uh, properties, right, that the Lightning Network has and that we ought to optimize in the, in the sense of privacy, right? So the first that you mentioned, let's dig into this, right? So this is the, the discrepancy between public channels and private channels, which, by the way, I really don't like the name private channels uh, because, well, they might not be actually private. I would, I would like to call them rather non-announced channels, right? So it's a Payment channel that is not publicly announced and attributed to a certain set of nodes, uh, but it is kept like non-announced uh, a secret between them, um, where you can then later selectively reveal uh, that you do own this uh, uh, this uh, payment channel, specifically with something known as routing hints. So maybe this is one of the first avenues. How can we like better selectively reveal that a node owns a private channel? Um, while improving the privacy guarantee of that. Yeah, um, I, I pretty much agree that it's, it's a really overstatement to, <laughs> to call these channels private channels, especially in the light of these, these, um, these findings by George Capos et al. Uh, but I mean, it, it, I suppose it would be just too long to call, uh, non announced. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. Don't get me wrong. I think this would be the, the, really the perfect term to use here, but, uh, you know, lost in translation. And uh, I guess there's not enough time to call, call it cop properly. So, uh, what I wanted to say is like, uh, how can you, uh, I think it's, it's pretty clever, simple and clever attack. Uh, how can you just observing on chain data? You can tell whether you have private channels. So. What they did in this paper and the, the method they used to find private channels. So just imagine like you are in the lightning network and okay, you see the public graph that's known to anyone, but you want more than this. You also want to find where are the edges in this graph, which is as of now, unvisible to you. How, how can you find this out? So this was the first question asked in this paper. And uh, even though obviously they were not able to find all these private channels, but um, they were able to find uh, like thirty percent of them or so, uh, which is which is pretty amazing. So 
Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm a bit curious of how they actually discovered these uh, private payment channels, um, and I would assume it was based when uh, on on the closing transaction of a channel, right? That uh, you especially when it was an uncooperative close, seeing that hash time lock contract on chain makes it a, a rather high likelihood guess that this actually was a payment channel. Um, but did they also discover ways to find a payment channel, a private payment channel? before it was closed? Yes, yes. Uh, so this is one of the, you were on the right track, and this was one of the the avenues they used, like closing tr uh, transactions. And the first one is, let's imagine there's Alice on the Lightning Network, and Alice has many uh, opened payment channels. So as, as we previously mentioned, uh, how, how does a, open, a payment channel opening transaction look like? It's a pay to witness uh, script hash uh, contract uh, transaction where we have it's a two out of two multisig essentially, and and we know that uh, as of uh, 2020, so when where the, whenever uh, this paper was written, that the capacity is less than uh, 0 0.16 bitcoin. So um, the the bottom line here is that it's pretty easy to find channel opening transactions because you know the amount that is quite restricted and you know also the script type, which, okay, obviously you can have uh, false positives, like not every transaction that has this kind of characteristics, it's a lightning opening transaction, that's for sure. But so you will have some false positive that's somewhat inevitable, but still you can find all the channel openings. And now, Let's assume that Alice opens many payment channels. So, and another idioms of use, which was uh, um, exploited in this paper, that um, okay, we also know that by the time, as of by the time of writing, channel openings were one-sided. So only one one of the parties could fund the transaction, uh, could fund the channel. So. Uh, let's suppose that Alice opens uh, payment channels and then such a transaction. So, for example, you have one Bitcoin and you open a payment channel with a capacity 0 0.1. So you will have an output with 0 0.1. That's a two out of two multisig. And you will have a change of 0 0.9 Bitcoin, right? And the idiom of use was by the time, and I suppose this is pretty much the much the case even today, that if you want to open another channel, then you would just reuse the, the change you got back uh, from this open, uh, channel opening transaction. So you take, Alice takes 0 0.9 Bitcoin and again opens another channel. So this is called the tracing heuristic in the paper. Um, and if, if we just want to summarize, the idea is that we use a peeling chain um, type of heuristic here. So if, if Alice has many channel openings, one after the other, uh, most likely Alice will always just reuse this change whenever Alice creates new and new payment channels. And, and you can imagine a situation like where Alice opens three payment channels, uh, which are public. Then something happens that you don't see on the Lightning Network, uh, but it's still a two out of two multisig. And then again, you see some, some other few uh, payment open, uh, payment channel opening transactions. And then you can, you can derive that in the middle, what you don't, what you didn't see on the Lightning Network that corresponds to a private payment channel. So this is the high level idea, what they used in the paper, uh, that basically exploited these idioms of use that, um, people tend to just reuse the change, uh, in, in subsequent, uh, payment channel opening transactions. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting, right? And, uh, it's something that if you just, you know, want the quick and easy and default use, that's exactly how you use the Lightning Network, right? You deposit, say, one Bitcoin to the wallet of your Lightning node and wait till that confirms and then open the first channel worth 0.1 Bitcoin, right? And that now we have like different, not just different amounts with 0 0.9 going back as change and 0 0.1 going into the payment channel, right? Which is this peeling chain type of analysis. We also have that script differentiation, right? That, uh, that one is your, like the change always goes back to your single public key, single stake wallet, 
while the payment channel is that multi-sig script hash wallet. Right? So here are actually two different kind of privacy leaks that we have. Uh, maybe now let's think about how we can solve both of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, nice because I, I was just thinking about the same stuff. So um, I think that's like so. Light the intro to Lightning privacy is on-chain privacy. So if we if we have such a, a bad behavior or a careless behavior on chain, like th this type of uh, a change address reuse, uh, like change reuse in this building chain stuff, then like what are we what 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 are we doing here? You know, at least from a privacy perspective, for sure. So um, I really hope that in the long term. Maybe after uh, Wabi Sabi, like in Wasabi one uh, three point oh, uh, I really hope that in, in a mid future it will be like uh, the default that whenever you want to open a payment channel, you will do it from a coin join. So I I I really think that this would be a super valuable collaboration between um, privacy and scalability. Between Wasabi and LND or other, uh, Lightning clients. And, and I, I think, uh, in some sense, it's, it's even inevitable, inevitable. And, and we just can't afford it to not happen because, uh, otherwise, what, what, what are we even doing here? Right. Right. Because the standard non coin join single user transaction has one input, right? Which is usually the change of the previous peeling chain output, right? Um, and then two outputs. And so it's a, a very small transaction of just one user where it's so easy to identify based on multiple things, right? But now imagine a lightning opening inside a coin join, right? Where we have 500 inputs and 600 outputs inside one gigantic transaction. All of a sudden, right? You see how it is already much more difficult to pinpoint which input and which output belong together, you know, specifically when the coin join itself is optimized uh, in terms of privacy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, um, sorry, just one step back. So like the reason why this is super, uh, duper important is because uh, usually on lightning, you don't many, many percentages of the nodes don't really use Tor. So it's really bad if I can link one of the lightning nodes that you own to your on chain entities. Uh, we call entity, uh, a cluster of addresses that belong to the same user. So that's also one of the pitfalls of, of Lightning usage is that because most people just use regular IPs uh, to access the Lightning network or to run a Lightning node uh, because it's the Tor support is not that great or I don't know what's the reason. Hopefully it will get better in the future. Uh, but I mean, it's pretty bad that if uh, people can just link uh, Bitcoin entities, clusters, uh, cluster, address clusters to IP addresses. So that's that's one of the reasons why we uh, we should be really um, concerned and 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 uh, responsible about uh, Lightning privacy and and on chain privacy. So what you started here is that uh, okay, uh, we identified the problem. How can we enhance privacy? especially whenever we enter uh, the off-chain space. So we open these payment channels. And uh, and so, okay, we have a coin joint transaction where we have like hundreds of equal outputs or, or not equal outputs. So we have some, some type of enhanced privacy on chain. Uh, then then it's also, it also means that the adversary or the on-chain uh, eavesdropper cannot know which Bitcoin entity funded uh, that specific uh, Lightning channel. Moreover, if we have Taproot, then this payment channel opening is even indistinguishable from re regular uh, uh, Bitcoin transactions and, uh, and UTXOs. Yeah, right. That's the second aspect. So CoinJoin solves the peeling chain issue with the amount correlation. And uh, Taproot solves the uh, in the identification based on different script types, right? So your change will always be your single public key, while that your channel is always that multi-sig script, 
right? Or that hash time lock contact on cooperative close. Well, with Taproot, well, single signatures, multi signatures, and adapter signatures all look exactly the same. And that covers uh, most of the Lightning Network on chain fingerprints based on scripts. Yes. And, um, I'm kind of an evangelist of, uh, of making this a, a reality, but I think you are as well, Max. So I, um, one of the future avenues for um, collaborations for Wasabi, I see it uh, uh, lightning integration or some kind of uh, collaboration between L&D and other clients. I think uh, it should be the norm like to, uh, if we want any kind of meaningful privacy guarantees or provisions on layer two, that every payment channel opening should, should occur inside a coin zone and, and um, it would be really nice to make this a reality in, I don't know, one or two years. I mean, we have so much work to do and, and, uh, there's little time and there's little energy. There's little human resource. Like would be nice to have a Wasabi mobile wallet. I don't know. So there's a lot of work to be done. And, but one of the most important, uh, in the long term, definitely after Wabi Sabi, uh, is, is, is lightning because, uh, the whole world uh, is will be going, uh, hopefully, to layer two because uh, that's the only way to go, I think, in the long term. Especially if we will have, I don't know, one one million dollars per Bitcoin, uh, then off chain transact on chain transactions will be quite expensive. Who knows? I mean, yeah, we cannot really tell the future, but uh, I think that's the big trend we need to see here. And um, if if the world is moving off chain. Uh, then we need to have privacy on chain because, uh, privacy is the oxygen of Bitcoin. It's, it's a little bit invisible. Uh, you don't really see that there's there, but once it's not there, we are just screwed because if there's no privacy, then the biggest value propositions of Bitcoin just fall. Like then we don't have censorship resistance. Uh, we don't have fungibility of the coins. So, um, layer two. Without privacy is, 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 I think, uh, just not going to work out. Uh, and, 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 and we are already need to, need to have it, have this in mind and work towards, uh, man, and, and even just think about ways how we can enhance privacy whenever people enter, uh, the lightning network or leave the lightning network or inside the lightning network. Because these are really gross issues, um, and I think most of the people are not really aware of this. Yeah, I very much agree. Advancing the privacy of Bitcoin really is the is of utmost importance. Um, do Do you think that we covered that first attack vector well, like that you can identify uh, private channels, uh, or, or do you have anything more to add on that point? Not really. I think, uh, if, if people want to read more about it, then it will be, please have a look at the, um, description of the video. And, um, uh, or if you have any questions, uh, just reach out to the authors. They are on Twitter or reach out to Max or me. Um, yeah, we can move on to the second one, which is, uh, balance discovery. So in, a, in, if Alice and Bob has a payment channel, um, the capacity of this payment channel is known to everyone. This was already mentioned. But we want to keep secret the balances. Why? So why do we want to keep the balances, the individual balances, uh, on the two sides of payment channels? Just, ex just imagine for a second that payment channels would have public, uh, balances. Then whenever a payment occurs on the Lightning Network, then it would be trivial to see in which path what amount just flowed. So. That's the reason, uh, where, why initially it was designed this way that we want to hide individual balances. Um, because if balances are not uh, hidden, then, well, every, every payment is, is visible to everyone. Um, and there were many papers, uh, my favorite and I think the, the, the most important is written by Sergei Kikomiro from University of Luxembourg, René Picard and others. Uh, it, it will be also in the description of the video. It, it's called uh, channel probing. So let's say there's Bob and Carol. And we want to see, we see the capacity of Bob and Carol's 
uh, payment channel. Uh, that's not the issue. What we want in this attack is to discover the individual balances of Bob's and Carol's in this payment channel, which which is the sum. Uh, so the sum of Bob and Carol's uh, balances uh, equals the capacity. So what we can do is uh, that we can probe this uh, payment channel. What, what what does probe mean here? Is we can try to open a payment channel to Bob. So Alice. Alice is the adversary now. Alice opens a payment channel to Bob, and Dave is another adversary. Opens a payment channel to Carol. So, like, it's it it now looks like a sandwich where Bob and Carol are in the middle of the sandwich, and er Alice and Dave are on the two sides. And what they are attempting to do here is that they are trying to Alice and Dave tries to Alice tries to send some payments to Dave, and and. Uh, with with different amounts and uh so the way the lightning network is designed if that if you send a, a a really high amount of payment then bob or carol will just uh, decline to root the payment because they will say hey i don't have this enough balance so i i, I just simply can't uh, uh root this payment for you and then they will send back an error message so with this in mind you can essentially probe the payment channel between Bob and Carol to find out the individual balances. So like, uh, and, and you can test whether the payment goes through because they will get the payment or not. So, and since both of these nodes are controlled by the adversary, you can probe this payment channel between Alice and Dave. And in, in a binary search manner, uh, you can easily find out and, and, uh, and find out easily that what's the exact amount uh, of the individual balances on the, on this payment channel. So that's the high level idea that we can use this uh, anytime you, you use a payment request to this channel, then you can figure out whether they have the payment amount or not. And just by halving the interval in each time in logarithmic number of steps, you can figure out uh, easily quite and quite efficiently as a matter of fact, uh, the individual balances of Bob and Carol and the spending channel. So this is uh, uh, the probing channel attack against balance secrecy. Uh, and maybe here it's worth to note, uh, again, just to remind the viewer that here's there's a, a, a really important trade-off between privacy and, uh, and uh, usability even, or if you wish, scalability or security. Because in some sense, we, we need to hide the balances of the payment channels, because if we don't hide, we, we will not have privacy. But if, uh, if, but from, from a routing point of view, it would be nice if you could have this information, because right now, like, really, if you just want to, in a, in a benefit, in a benign way, you just want to route a payment to your peer, then you just don't know where to route it because uh, you see the capacities, but it's not enough information to, to, a capacity is essentially just an upper bound on the balances available on the payment channel. So you don't really know where to start routing. Um, so like, it seems an inherent tension here between privacy and uh, routing efficiency and and I, I don't see a way how to how to I mean in the paper they have a nice discussion but uh, it's really just a, a really difficult problem to solve yeah but this so this probing attack to summarize this is basically to find out what the current balance is of the payment channel and the way that you do it is that you start sending a really large payment that is still underneath the capacity. Um, and you see if it goes through, yes or no, right? If it does not go through, then you know, well, the local capacity is, is lower or the local balance is lower than, than that payment amount and therefore it did not go through, right? But if finally that payment does get routed successfully, then you know that, well, there used to be more than this capacity in the channel uh, or balance on, on this side of the channel. Um, but you said earlier that here Alice and David need to be on both the beginning and the end of the route. And I'm not sure I understand exactly why that is. It seems to me that Alice can do this probing attack just by sending to different non-malicious uh, peers. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's also possible, yeah. Uh, it, it really depends whether you rely on the error messages because the way it's constructed is that whenever you get back an error message, um, it also indicates where the payment failed, whether at Bob's sites or Carol's sites. So there are two flavors of probing attacks. Uh, and yeah, uh, in, in one of the attacks, you, you don't really rely on Dave also being uh, an adversary. Um, so put differently, what you just described is that essentially every round of the attack, you learn one bit information about the, the balances, whether it's smaller or larger than, uh, than a certain value. And, uh, like, uh, so it's, it's pretty efficient because in each round, you learn one bit of information about the balance. And I don't know. The balance is, is, is less than 0 0.60 Bitcoin, 16 Bitcoin, sorry. So, um, which is, I don't know, two to the seven Satoshis. So it's, it's like less than 22 bits of information, two to the 22. So it's pretty easy to, to figure out, uh, with probing individual balances. Uh -huh, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Now, let's think a bit, oh, you said it's difficult, but let's try to solve it. Uh, because one of the issues that I see is that if the route does not succeed, you, the attacker gets valuable information, but he does not even have to pay a routing fee to, to get that information. Yeah. So what I missed, in, uh, so to the, to clear the picture up a little bit. So you don't even need to send a valid payment hash. Obviously you can just fake any payment hash you want. So another upside of this probing channel attack is that essentially the attacker doesn't even need to burn money on this. Like, uh, you just need to have a way to see that the payment would go through or not. Uh, so you, you don't need to necessarily actually send the payment itself. And I'm not exactly sure what the latest is on this here, but I know that there is work to get, uh, that you have to prepay basically, if you already in the setup of a routing process. So you pay some base fee, regardless if the route is successful or not. Um, do you think that this is a, a, a interesting concept to improve privacy here? Mm, yeah, or, or like, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I didn't really think that much about it, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's reasonable to suspect a, a world where if you want to, like, for example, you can query the individual balances, not just the capacity of the payment channel, but you need to pay for it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not, how to say, it's not a cleanest solution, but it's a somewhat crypto economic way of uh, solving this problem. So like you can't do this attack, uh, greedily or, or at least you need to pay for it. Um, it's, it's obviously not the cleanest and way, but I mean, it's a suboptimal solution, but better than nothing. Yeah. But as you said earlier, right, we kind of have to assume that the adversary has a lot of money, right? And is willing to burn it. Um, I at mean, least if... I mean, they will surely have, I mean, if they want to disrupt Bitcoin. So that's, that's always, so that's always the adversary we need to have in mind. Bitcoin needs to survive nuclear bombs and, and, uh, governments or whatever. I don't, I don't want to mention any nations. So, um, they will surely have capital, human resources, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, do you think we have covered this part of probing the balance of a channel uh, properly? And can we move on to the next? Yeah, sure. Um, please read the paper by Sergei Tikomirov, uh, René Picard, and others from Luxembourg and Norway. Uh, it will be in the description of the video. And if you have any questions, reach out to the authors or to Max or me. Yeah. And uh, we can move to the path discovery. So, uh, so how can we have or not have own path relationship anonymity? So that was the third um privacy perspective or privacy provision guarantee we wanted to aim for. So whenever the adversary is one of the routers in a payment path, then we want the adversary not to be able to tell who is the real sender and the real receiver of the payment. Um, so that's what this privacy guarantee says. And uh 
and here comes into the play that lightning is 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 inherently uh, a graph theoretic code. It's a graph. So and as of a graph, lightning is is a small world graph. So you know, there's this. It, it, I think. Do you know Max this? Uh, Six degree of separation. So in the social graph of the world, it's, it was a conjecture that if the nodes are people and the connection between the people are friendships or, or that they know each other. So some kind of relationship. Then if we pick any two people on the world, like, I don't know, some random guy in Africa and some random guy in Asia, then there will be maximum six uh, people between them. So like, one guy from Africa can introduce this guy to another in Europe. Then this Europe guy will know someone in Australia. And then so finally, after some hopes, we can uh, arrive to Asia. Th th this, this is called six degree of separation. So this is like intuitively, like tries to explain the phenomenon that no matter how big is the world or the social graph of the world, uh, the diameter of this graph is really small. Uh, like this is called a small world phenomenon. Or, or put differently, six, de six degree of separation. Is it something super known? Or maybe, I don't know. I'm just, uh. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think this makes sense. Or maybe to take this analogy now to the Bitcoin Lightning Network, right? Yes. The individual n nodes in the network are literally Lightning Network nodes. And their connections in between them are payment channels. Right. Yes, and so the question yes. is, if you have a node somewhere on the left side of the graph and a node somewhere on the right side of the graph, um, speaking as a map, right? How many payment channel hops, uh, do you have to go through before you can reach them? Um, and, exactly. you know, exactly. you use this in every lightning payment, right? Every lightning payment has three, four, five, maybe even six hops, right? So, but how does this all tie now into the privacy aspect? Yeah. So, um, so whenever you want to send a payment, let's model any kind of payment you might want to send in the Lightning Network as just we randomly pick two nodes on the graph. And then we try to, because this is how the clients are implemented currently. So clients strive for finding the cheapest route, route between the two nodes. So the cheapest route means essentially that the shortest path. And um, since Lightning is a so-called scale-free graph, so, meaning that the lightning graph is a small world graph, uh, it means that usually uh, the shortest path between any two random nodes will be con will consist of one or two hops. So like uh, that's the vast majority of lightning nodes of lightning payments. And obviously, if there's a single router node, like let, let's, let's assume that Alice wants to send a payment to Bob and Eve is the, now Eve is the evil guy. E Eve is the router. Then with high probability, Eve can suspect that he is the only router node. So in that case, uh, it doesn't really matter that Eve doesn't know its exact place in the routing path. Eve only knows the predecessor node, Alice, and the uh, subsequent node, Bob. But if can just uh, say, I mean, okay, whatever. I don't know whether what's the length, exact length of this payment uh, path due to onion routing. But I can I can just uh, guess that I am the only router node because this is a super small graph. I mean, even in the even in the whole world's social graph has six degree of separation. Lightning is a way smaller graph and. Uh, you can imagine that here the we only have one or two degrees of separation. So, um, so with high probability, Alice uh, Eve can just guess that Alice is the real sender and Bob is the real recipient. And uh, and uh, certain simulations show even in uh, our paper that we made uh, with some researchers in Budapest and also other paper other authors show that. This is indeed the case that more than 20 or 30 percent of the cases, it is really likely that we will have just a single router node. 
And um, just to make the picture more clear, even if we have multiple router nodes, um, it is really also likely that these multiple router nodes are controlled by the same entity. So that's like the pitfall of lightning privacy. So even if you have two or three nodes, there are so many valid, uh, so many wealthy guys on the Lightning Network that it's, it, it, it can be really the case that, um, both of these router nodes or even three of them are, are controlled by the same uh, guy, same entity, same company. And, uh, and obviously if, if, uh, if I know that who is the real sender and recipient of a payment, then it's, it's a privacy hell because then I know that Max is now buying a sticker. Max is now buying a slice of pizza. Max is buying now whatever. So I can profile users. Um, I can deny routing payments because now Max wants to, I don't know, watch porn, buy drugs, or just do some political activities. I'm not, uh, I'm not aligned with. So, you know, um, this is, this is really don't something which we don't want. And, and, so here we have a trade-off. Okay, so now we uh, see that there's a privacy pitfall here, um, that payment paths are short. What can we do about it? Now we need to... So the good thing about Lightning is that payments are source routed. So always the, the sender of the payment decides on the length and also the intermediary nodes of payment. So this means that if we really want privacy, then most likely we need to rely on longer payment paths, but at the cost of increased uh, transaction fees, um, which is, I think it's fine because transaction fees are anyways pretty low on Lightning. But uh, more importantly, it also decreases the reliability of payment routing. So if we need to have two or three hops, then it decreases the success probability that the payment goes through because maybe some of the routers we selected are offline or they don't have enough capacity uh, and so on and so forth. And another last aspect I want to bring here is that also the payment amount has an effect on privacy. So this is, um, this is pretty easy to see why this is the case. So, for example, Alice sends a, uh, sends a payment to Bob again. And now let's say, so Alice and Bob, and now we have Carol and Dave, uh, as the intermediaries. <laughs> it's bad that we can't, uh, draw in this show. Anyways, maybe it will be uh, understandable. So the idea is that the anonymity set of each real sender is basically, so, we have Alice and Bob, Carol and Dave, and now Dave is not sure whether Carol is the real sender of the payment or Alice. So maybe Dave can think that Carol is the real sender or Alice is the real sender or one of Carol's neighbors, right? So this is basically the anonymity set of the sender of the payment. And if the payment value is, is, somewhat large, then already can exclude Dave from the anonymity set certain payment channels depending on this value. So for example, uh, it, let's suppose one of Carol's uh, neighbors' uh, capacity is lower than the payment, routed payment amount. Then we, we can be sure that the payment cannot come from that neighbors of Alice because uh, simply the payment amount is larger than the capacity of the payment chain. So this way, uh, also we see a trade-off between privacy and the amount of the amount of the payment. Uh, that's also something we need to keep in mind. Yeah, you bring up many good points, right? So the first is if the route is very short, right, only one hop, then if the adversary knows that and he's in the middle of this, he knows exactly who's left and right of him. And so this, of course, turns into basically no privacy against that middleman adversary. Then th the other aspect you bring up is the, if it's a large amount, right, we can, we can exclude the neighbors who have a low capacity channels only, right, that are below that payment amount. 
They yes. can obviously yes. not route. I, I would like to bring up a third one, uh, and that is sending rounded amounts, right? Because if you send exactly 0 0.100000 Bitcoin, right, uh, then it become, it can become obvious how deep down in the route you are, depending on how many, how much additional money is in, uh, is, is used on top of that, right? Because there are routing fees. So if, if you want to give the receiver exactly the 0 0.1000 Bitcoin, right, then you will have to give every participant in the route just a little bit above that, right? So for example, really good point, really good point. Right. Yeah. So the last person in the route will see 0 0.1000100, right? For example, uh, if he gets 100 cents in routing this payment. Uh, and th this would maybe mean that he can find out, okay, this is only 100 sats above a very rounded amount. Maybe that was the target sending amount. And based on how much fees is left, he can also make a more educated guess on how many further hops are at the other end uh, of the route still. Yeah, very really good point. Yes, yes. And... Uh... So this so, also yeah, both b both on chain and in Lightning don't send rounded amounts. It's bad for privacy for different reasons, but it's both bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just discovered this like uh, a few days ago. I sent a. <laughs> uh, it's it, I disclose myself here. You will not find me on on the blockchain, but I, I sent a rounded payment amount, and that and then I checked the transaction on blockstream.info and I, I felt so ashamed like <laughs> like <laughs> it's it's really valuable this feature on blockstream.info that you that it, it says that and like blockstream.info was shouting at me that this is most likely a payment amount because it's around it uh satoshi amount one of the inputs and I felt like, come on, I'm such a clone, you know, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a privacy advocate. I, I'm, I'm doing my PhD in privacy and privacy enhancing for cryptocurrencies and, and still, uh, I fall into this trap, but, uh, fuck, it was like, <laughs> oh my goodness, what a loser I am. It was so funny. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but I guess it also shows the mistake of the wallet, right? I would say that a good wallet, uh, will prevent you or at least give you a notification that sending a rounded amount is bad for privacy and maybe even automatically add or subtract a small amount of sats to no longer make it rounded. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, anyways, it's, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> so w one thing what I wanted to say with respect to this, um, uh, the length of, uh, payment paths is that so now maybe hopefully the viewers and the listeners really see that, uh, so we privacy on lightning is just a completely different animal. So, so for example, such concerns, we don't even have on chain because we don't have intermediaries. We don't have payment paths. Um, so it really makes our life just, uh, easier at, at least on chain, but even the on chain privacy is super hard. Uh, so. Yeah. And, and, and for example, it's, it, it's really nice to think about the differences, uh, and how completely different beasts are on chain and off chain privacy. Like, for example, if I send a trans, a Bitcoin transaction with, with 200 bitcoins, then the, or one Bitcoin, then the size of the transaction does not affect my privacy, right? Because, uh, why, why would it affect? So such a phenomenon on changes does not exist at all. But in Lightning, um, payment amount and the privacy guarantees of the payment, uh, is really depends on the size of the payment. Yeah. So, uh, right. Large value and low, pay, low value uh, payments here. And I would guess large value payments have a, a, a lower anonymity set, a lower level of privacy. Yes, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how this will evolve in the future, right? If, if both the total size of the Lightning Network, as well as, you know, the average channel capacity increases, um, that hopefully that will then strengthen the anonymity set just because there are more Lightning Network users of all sizes and shapes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope so as well. Uh, I, I, I really don't like to make, especially in the crypto sphere, the Bitcoin sphere, it's really hard to make any predictions because the whole, uh, the whole scene evolves super fast. 
um, would be nice. And um, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Lightning. I'm a big fan of uh, scalability and privacy of Bitcoin. I want this uh, whole ecosystem to see uh, that it flourishes. Uh, but but honestly, I think uh, there are also these free uh, limitations already show that uh, light off-chain privacy, at least as it is now, it's just completely inferior to on-chain privacy. So uh, if, like, for example, in a coin join transaction, you can easily have uh, hundreds of anonymity sets, right? So a single UTXO of yours can have K anonymity of, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80. So a lot. You have a lot of plausible deniability. You, th- you have a lot of K anonymity. But in the Lightning Network, if you want to achieve the same level of anonymity, in terms of K anonymity at least, uh, it means that you need to have, I don't know, dozens of payment channels open. Because essentially, the your anonymity set is the set of your neighbors. So the more payment channels you have, uh, your intermediary nodes will might think that uh, one of your neighbors is the real sender of the transaction and not you. So here also seems like an inherent uh, trade-off between privacy and costs. So you have more privacy if you spend uh, if you open more channels, or you 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 are willing to send your payment on longer routes. So yeah, um, difficult and uh, inherent trade-offs, it seems. Um, and it would be nice to have maybe some lightning native uh, privacy enhancing techniques. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm really thinking about loud here because I don't see a way, honestly. Yeah, yeah, there's for sure a lot of more thinking and research to be done. Um, I'm, I'm curious if we can further defend against that uh, adversary who is part of the route itself, uh, and especially how multi-part payments uh, can help here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, obviously I'm bullish on, on multi-part payments. Uh, it, it will surely help, but uh, um, still the main issues will remain, but a little bit... Um, uh, maybe it would be an overstatement, like security by obscurity, because it's not uh, obscurity, this multi-part payments, but it, it, it does not solve the issue substantially. It, it, it surely improves on the situation, that's, uh, without doubt. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't improve, but it, it doesn't solve it substantially. So, uh, I'm bullish on multi-part payments for sure, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. So, I, 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 so one problem that it for sure solves is the rounded amount issue, right? Because now with multi-part payments, you can send in total exactly 0.1000, but it is split up into non-rounded, uh, like smaller parts where you have like four or five, uh, routes that go through that, that then sum up to 0.1. Um, I mean, maybe that's an improvement, but actually you could do a subset sum analysis or something. Um, uh, or something similar, just, you know, seeing that, okay, the, there were four routes and they exactly sum up to 0.1000. So with some likelihood, they belong together. And so maybe that's not even a valid argument. Um, the, the other thing that it, that it also improves is, I think, larger value routes. Uh, just because, you know, if you split up a large value into many smaller value routes, uh, it, it seems to me that it increases the, the size of the neighbors, right? The amount of size of the I neighbors. Agree. I agree and good point. Yeah. Um, maybe I didn't put quite eloquently my points. So both of your points are absolutely correct and right. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that the inherent trade-offs will still be there. So, um, the situation will be somewhat better, but the trade-off itself will still present. So. Unlike on in an on-chain scenario, yeah, and you know, I, I think what you mean with the trade off is that you know uh, now you have not just one route but many routes, right? Meaning there is a lot more uh, unreliability that one of the route fails, 
Especially when you consider that each of these routes should have many hops. Right? If you have five, route, five routes that each just have one hop, that's not much privacy either. So you need five routes that each have four different hops, right? Or four, five, six hops even. All of a sudden, that's many, many more nodes involved uh, who can go offline or just for some reason uh, not uh, fulfill that route, uh, making it much more unreliable. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the main issue here, that uh, whenever you want more meaningful privacy, more anonymity, more anon set, then you need to sacrifice on transaction fees, you need to sacrifice on reliability of the payment paths because your payment paths will get twice as long or three times as long or who know who knows how to, how how many times more long longer uh yeah, this is exactly uh, the trade off uh, what I wanted to say, but you said it more nicely. Okay, yeah. So do you think there are any other uh, things that we should consider against the adversary who is part of the road? No, I, I think it was pretty much covered everything. Uh, again, um, there, there, there will be some papers. So whoever just listens to the end of this uh, podcast, then please have a look at the description of the video and uh, you will find some great articles there where you can read uh, more in depth about these topics, what we cover here. Yeah, so let's move on then to the the fourth and maybe final uh, adversarial threat model here, where the adversary is not part of the world. So he does have payment channels. It's not just a passive adversary who just listens, um, but he does have payment channels. However, they are not part of the route. That's actually something that I didn't really consider much before. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so uh, just as a reminder, this privacy guarantee is called uh, off-path payment privacy. So even if you are not part of the payment privacy, then we want the uh, details of this payment to be hidden from any non-participant uh, router nodes. And um, so this is somewhat feels uh, too unrealistic or too strong uh, adversary. But the idea here is that the attacker creates network snapshots, uh, meaning that let's forget about how the adversary does this, but let's let's assume that the adversary knows that knows that uh, at certain time tau or at certain time t, the adversary knows all the individual balances and knows every information of the uh, network. Maybe he was probing the channels or whatever, and then some time occurs and. Now we have another snapshot uh, at a time point t plus tau. I, I don't know after ten minutes or five minutes or one hour. And now obviously you will see different individual balances of, of the network. And now, given the two differences between these snapshots, uh, can you infer individual payment and and in individual payment amounts? And uh, again, there's this uh, paper. Uh, by George Kapos et al., where, where they argue that, um, with some simulations that, yeah, it's pretty easy that if you have multiple snapshots of the network with individual balances, or even if you just know a certain part of the network with individual balances, and you see the snapshots, then it's pretty easy and straightforward to, to f figure out w where and where payments occurred with what amount. Um, yeah. Okay, so is some with this a threat model, somehow you need to figure out the actual balance of some channels, right? Maybe not all, but a certain amount of it at least. Um, and then if you get this type of information, the exact channel balances, at different points in time, then you can see the at least net difference between these points in time, and that indicate general flows. Right? And I would assume that the longer this time period in between the two snapshots, the more vague this analysis is. Right? Um, so if it, if you take like a snapshot every week, well, then you see this, the, the total difference of plus minus a week. Right? But uh, if you take the snapshot once every 30 minutes, right, then you get much more granular information of when a payment happened. Uh, and you will catch not just the aggregate of it, but many more of the individual payments themselves. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
I think um, so. One of the reasons they argue in the paper that they didn't uh, conduct this uh, analysis because it's non-ethical, which is surely true. Uh, but I'm also I think one of the reasons is that uh, it's it's it requires quite uh, a powerful adversary. But I mean, uh, obviously, it doesn't mean anything that a few enthusiast uh, and talented researchers didn't have the energy and time and human resources to do it in University College London and Cornell or I don't know where they study it doesn't mean that uh, other guys will not do it so we we certainly need to consider such types of attacks against privacy so this sounds quite scary because what can we even do to prevent such types of attacks Mm, yeah, um, not that much. I mean, uh, and, <laughs> and I, I don't know how much time we have, but up to this point, we only considered an adversary, which, which only part of the Lightning Network and, and only tries to break uh, privacy guarantees of the Lightning Network. So uh, there's, uh, there's one more paper, at least, uh, I would like to mention, uh, and just, to have the feeling of this uh, complexity that we also need to consider cross-layer de-anonymization methods. So ultimately your goal is to map lightning nodes and lightning and uh, lightning uh, participants to Bitcoin entities and Bitcoin addresses. Uh, so this is the ultimate um, lightning um, de-anonymization task. And, uh, and there are many patterns and and uh, ways how one can link Bitcoin entities, clusters of addresses to Lightning nodes, and uh, that's also a really interesting paper. And uh, yeah, so this is the whole picture whenever we talk about Lightning privacy, because up to this point in the last I don't know one and a half hour almost, we only considered the privacy guarantees only in this lightning universe but we should not forget that uh there's a maybe even bigger universe at least as of today bigger than lightning itself that's the bitcoin blockchain okay so how do we combine these two networks and and how do we take the analysis of both parts of it and so the idea is that okay so a payment channel is usually described as the two nodes of the Lightning Network. So Alice, Alice has a node identifier on the Lightning Network. Bob has a node identifier on the Lightning Network. And um, a payment channel is also has a uh, another identifier, which is the transaction ID, uh, which funded that channel. So, and now uh, we want to assess who was uh, the funder of a payment channel. So essentially, that's like uh, this linkage means that Alice funded the payment channel or Bob. And, uh, and there are many idioms of use which can be exploited to find this out. And uh, this is quite similar to the attacks uh, written uh, previously in the George Kapos et al. paper. Uh, so maybe maybe I can quickly... Uh, just describe this. So imagine that Alice opens many payment channels and, and reuses the, the change of the previous payment channel, attack, uh, payment channel opening transactions. Then you can, you can see that, uh, Alice opened payment channels with this t a specific transaction IDs. And then it, it's, it's really easy to also map this to, uh, to Bitcoin addresses. Then, then you can surely see who funded the transaction yeah so this attack goes basically from the on-chain layer to the lightning layer right so that you look at the peeling chain and therefore you find out who was the funding party of this uh channel um yes but actually i think the attack might even be more obvious and more dangerous the other way around and right? so that you take information from the lightning network and apply it to on-chain privacy because, for example, even if you do a coin join in between all your Lightning Network channel openings, right, and so there's no obvious link on the blockchain itself about that one person controls all of these coins that open the Lightning channel, 
because they have the anonymity side of the coin join, right? But if these are publicly announced lightning channels, uh, then obviously uh, the, there's one lightning network public key that signs off owning all of these individual payment channels. Uh, and therefore, it, he signs off that uh, one person controlled all of these coins in these individual coin join transactions, making the clustering basically, you know, or the clustering defenses of, of coin joins completely obsolete, right? Uh, because you do voluntarily and publicly announce the cluster that all these payment channels belong to the same node. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there are many such idioms of use uh, identified uh, in this paper by Matteo Romiti, Fritan Victor, Matteo Maffei, Pedro Moreno Sanchez, and, and uh, many others. Um, so it, it's really uh, easy to map um, most of these idioms of use to lightning uh, and, and vice, vice versa, as you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, it, it's so just, how can uh, we solve them? It seems like another very difficult problem. But what do you think? Yeah, I I don't know. I, I mean, I think if we zoom out the history of lightning so far, I think in the last two or three years, um, the main design goal was just to make it work, just to launch it and ship it something to the users without any consideration to privacy. And um, I, honestly, this is a really common theme in, in cybersecurity or, or any, uh, any informatics system, right? So like usually you just want to ship something which works and then you think privacy later. And uh, now it really seems that uh, without changing the design, the initial design of the Lightning Network, uh, the bolts, uh, it's, it's, uh, seems almost impossible to have a meaningful privacy guarantee. So currently I don't see a way to solve it. Obviously coin joins. Um, I'm, I'm an advocate that, uh, uh, Wasabi should integrate somehow LND and other clients and, and, uh, opening payment channels from a coin join should be the norm, especially whenever we have that put. Uh, that, that surely helps, uh, but, uh, privacy is much more nuanced. So we also shouldn't forget about the lightning part of this story. And I even in that case, uh, I, I think maybe structural changes are necessary to be done. Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, I, I think as of now, the most important is from our side, at least just to educate users, to raise awareness, and then just to start, uh, start, kickstart this, uh, public, uh, discussion and conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I would be really sad to see stupid tweets in a week or in, in a month. So hopefully now, uh, this message gets to more people. Uh, and then, from that on, we can, we can move to forward and, and maybe, maybe make, make it a little bit better, but it, it's gonna be just hard. Yeah, there's for sure a lot of work, uh, to be done. Um, and I mean, we discussed some of the solutions already, but maybe we can venture out now into more, uh, breaking changes, you know, things that would not be trivial to, to upgrade the current lightning network. Uh, so. What are your thoughts on changing the actual payment channel structure and construction? Right? Because there are more, let's say, advanced privacy focused payment channel types, like uh, anonymous asynchronous locks or CK channels and, and all these types. So what do you think about that approach in general? Promising for sure. Um, I, I'm not sure whether this zero knowledge uh, uh, payment channel is applicable to Bitcoin because then, uh, you would need to verify the zero knowledge proof on chain, no? Whenever you close the channel, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah you're right. Bad example. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, I mean, yeah, that was a paper written by Matthew Green and Jan Myers and maybe others. Uh, it, it was a payment channel construction for Zcash, if I'm not mistaken. So you can surely do, that would be the ideal, obviously. So, um, so basically all this, what we have discussed in the last one and a half hour is purely 
possible because uh, Lightning cannot use heavy cryptographic machinery. So if we would have confidential transactions um, to or zero knowledge proofs, uh, then this wouldn't be a problem, and then this podcast episode would never be a subject or <laughs> would just never come to existence at all. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's kind of our favorite meme at the Wasabi Research Club. Like, uh, what just we, we implement confidential transactions, and that kind of solves all our problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, even like recently there was another paper called Blitz. Uh, maybe we can also link that in the in the description of the video. So yeah, I, I'm kind of aware, but I'm not that much knowledgeable in this new um, payment channel constructions and and routing algorithms. Uh, the, the literature here is pretty uh, abundant and dense, but. Uh, I don't know. Uh, my fingers are crossed, and uh, I just hope the best for for uh, for our ecosystem. Uh, I, I I really don't want to make any judgments because um, I'm not that well prepared. I mean, for example, this latest paper uh, by Pedro Moreno Sanchez, Matteo Maffei also involved, uh, and some others from Technische Universität Wien. This paper is called Blitz. And, um, for example, it looks like a huge, massive improvement on the status, state of the art, uh, routing algorithm and, and how payments are routed on the Lightning Network. And, and it seems totally comp compatible with the Bitcoin protocol. So that would be like really nice. And as far as I can tell, uh, uh I just had like one or two questions at the end of this seminar to Pedro. They, they are in, in, in contact with the lightning guys so hopefully maybe in the long term it will be also implemented who knows um but but again it requires some structural changes to the bolts so it, it, it definitely will not happen uh tomorrow can you maybe give an intuition about how this blitz routing mechanism works so I'm not going to tell how it works, but what they achieve. I think it's more important. So, yeah. so the one of, I think, I think one of the downsides of lightning and uh, the source of, uh, of, uh, of difficulties is that payment routing is unreliable. And the reason is that there's a lot of communication complexity. So, not sure. I don't think we need, we have that much time to describe uh, how payment routing works on the Lightning Network. But, uh, the, the thing is that basically the receiver sends back, uh, an invoice, sends an invoice to the sender and, and sends back a hash value to the sender. And then uh, the pre image goes from the sender to the receiver. Or, or, or this is like a super simplified picture how how it works. So the the problem with this is that um, each intermediary needs to talk to the predecessor and the and the predecessor uh, and the subjects went node in the payment routing like twice. Once they root, uh, so they root back and forth basically information. So. Currently, each intermediary node will need to contact the predecessor and the subsequent node twice. Uh, and the improvement in this Blitz paper is that now this is only true for the sender and the receiver. So the intermediary nodes will only talk, need to talk to the predecessor or subsequent node only once. So it, it is somewhat a better in terms of communication complexity that's also really nice and uh what is also nice is uh it, it's it's completely compatible uh with bitcoin so it would be implementable and launchable even today uh but obviously for that you need to modify a bolt uh, so it's not that easy but uh yeah so it's a slight improvement or not slight depending how you see 
um, but it's an improvement on, on the current uh, routing algorithm. Okay, that's very interesting. Thanks for the summary. Uh, there's, there's one more point that I think we did not highlight. Uh, we spoke about the on-chain privacy benefits of Taproot, and that it becomes more difficult to fingerprint exactly what is going on on-chain. But I'm curious how you perceive that Taproot and Schnorr signatures and these discrete law contracts and uh, stuff will improve the routing privacy of the Lightning Network. Good question. Um, I'm not sure it does. I mean, the, my understanding is that Taproot mostly improves the on-chain privacy part of the story. Um, I'm not sure Taproot will have any effect on the off-chain part and the bolt uh, specification part of the story. So I would say none, but maybe my understanding is flawed. So I'm not really up to date with uh, with the most recent Taproot uh, discussions and developments. So maybe it's, it's just my limitation. So please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I I do know of of one noteworthy improvement, and that is again the the switch away from hashed time lock contracts to point time lock contracts. Uh, similar functionality: you have a secret. First, you commit to the secret, and later you reveal the secret, and something happens. Um, so with hashed time lock contracts, you have a secret, the pre-image, then you commit to the secret, and it turns into a hash, and later you reveal the original secret, the pre-image, and something happens. Uh, and we here there is the issue that when we use these H HTLCs on a route, every person in the route knows the same commitment, the same hash, and the same preem image. Uh, and therefore, if Alice uh, and you know David are three, four hops uh, separated, but they talk to each other, they can actually find out that they are on the same route because they have the same hash preem image. Um, this gets even worse with multipath routing. Right, uh, because I think in a naive implementation here, we would have the same hash pre-image for every route. Uh, so you know, like multiple routes with multiple hops, but everyone, if they would talk to each other, would find out that they're part of the same payment. And now this gets improved with these point time lock contracts that work with adapter signatures uh, in Schnorr, uh, where here uh, the the secret is basically um, uh, somewhat like a private key. Uh, and it's commit to in the public key and later revealed in the signature. Rough overgeneralization of how this works, but the, the gist of it is the same. Um, and what we can do here is to tweak the secret with every hop so that every hop has a different uh, commitment and revelation of the secret. And it is no longer obvious that you are part of the same route. Uh, which I think is is a nice privacy improvement in terms of, of routing. Yeah, gotcha. I didn't know these things. Um, nice. Uh, but, uh, I mean, even if Taproot would be activated tomorrow, this this still needs some time, right, to implement and to change Bolt. And, uh, but I'm, I, obviously, you're right. This is a, this is a super nice improvement. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. But, uh, like, we've, we've found so many small minor improvements uh over these over the time that it might you know even be time for somewhat as a soft fork or even a hard fork of the lightning network so to speak um to upgrade it properly uh and you know the things could further improve with you know something like l2 uh that changes the payment channel construction type uh it requires another soft fork uh, on the bitcoin consensus rules um but like there seem to be, and now as you mentioned the splits, right? There seem to be many quite decent improvements that we can make to the Lightning Network protocol if we change the the bolts and the specifications, uh, and maybe even in a backwards incompatible way, and right? so that you know, people do have to upgrade. Uh, I'm curious how that will evolve because it's not just a lot of work in actually you know conceptually coming up with it and implementing the code with it, but also to coordinate that implementation and the deployment of all of this across all the you now many Lightning Node implementations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should clone Christian Decker and René Picard and all these enthusiastic guys. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I really like this quote. I, I, I'm pretty sure you know better than me. I, I just can't recall it uh, word by word. Maybe it was by Litecoin from Twitter or Instagibs. I don't know. So the, the, the quote says like... Uh, 
I'm not afraid that lightning will not be ready. I'm afraid, or, or I'm not afraid lightning will not be ready and there's no need for it. I'm afraid that lightning will not be ready by the time there will be need for it or something like this. Do you, do you, rem- do you remember for this quote? Oh, no, not exactly verbatim. So, um, but yeah, the, the gist is, is right here, right? I mean, sure, we got this proof of concept out at the end of 2018, right? And, uh, or sorry, end of 2017. Um, and sure, you could play around with it back then. It was for sure not ready, right? Now we had another two, almost three years, uh, to, to work on it, to improve it. Uh, but it seems that still, uh, we are so far off from having an actually reliable and robust like payment network that actually you know works where not 60 percent of all routes fail right or probably even more of them uh and yeah. of course the many privacy aspects that we spoke here like we're not yet ready i would say yeah we should not point fingers because maybe this will be very much our story with wabi sabi like that's also <laughs> seems like a super ambitious stuff and uh i remember like uh with conversations with uh, Gergő, Balint, Adam, we were saying that uh, we will be ready by 2020, end of 2020, we will do it, we will be surely ready and launch it, and yeah, it's just not going to happen. So, uh, it, it, it's really ambitious, and uh, the reason I'm a little bit not afraid, but concerned, let's say, that uh, given these uh, price evaluations, um, and it, it, it will just get worse in the sense that price will just rise, rise, rise. More, more and more retail people will come to Bitcoin. And, uh, and as more and more people use Bitcoin, uh, more and more demand there is for block space. Uh, it will be more apparent that, uh, we need to move off chain. And, uh, and I really hope by the time that there will be this massive need um, for Bitcoin off chain. I, I hope there will be massive need for Bitcoin off chain, uh, because that means that we are on the right track. That Lightning will not be ready. Um, that's that's one of my fears, but maybe it's it's a sweet fear because that that then it means that there's massive need for Bitcoin and and uh, transactions off chain. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should be happy if whenever this occurs. Yeah, uh, it's it's really quite a, a big work. And as you said, like looking back at Wabi Sabi, it's a rather small, you know, niche project, but it turned out to be humongous in in work effort, right, and, and research effort. Um, no, you know, I I would love to have a privacy focused Lightning implementation in Wasabi. <laughs> but looking at it, that's like, it seems like 10 years of work at least, uh, to get it right, uh, and into a, a noteworthy privacy focused implementation. Oh, I mean, sure, we will have to do it, right? But it's, it's a work that I'm somewhat dreading just by the scope of it. Obviously, I'm biased, so maybe you shouldn't count on my opinion, but, uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, I, I got your point why you are saying that, uh, Wasabi is, uh, or Wabi Sabi is a niche project because privacy is, might not be everyone's top one priority. But, uh, I think, uh, for Bitcoin to succeed, the two most important projects, uh, uh, for surely are projects that involve scalability and privacy. So, Lightning as a whole, the whole Lightning ecosystem, and also Wasabi. And then obviously there are many more um, really important uh, parts of the ecosystem, like BTC Pay and others, like I don't know, who, who work in education, who work in marketing. But uh, for me, at least, these are the two most important, uh, Lightning and, and, uh, and Wasabi. So we need scalability and we need privacy. Uh, so... That's, uh, I, I would, uh, fight that Wasabi is not a niche or hopefully will not be a niche. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Like, I, I hope that every transaction on chain will, or many at least will be gigantically large coordinated coin joins. Uh, I think that would, uh, improve privacy substantially. Um, but w- what I meant with niche is more like it's such a small part in the overall 
privacy toolkit that users ought to have by default, right? And even building out that small part, you know, arguably the easy part, um, took, took such a amount of effort. Uh, and we just spoke about, you know, a handful of, of things that we have to worry about in Lightning. And as you said, we just scratched the surface of it, right? Um, so yeah, there, it, 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 it's not going to be boring. Let's, let's put it like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, recently I met Gerge, uh, the day before yesterday, I, I had a nice conversation with Gerge, uh, from Wasabi. And, uh, yeah, there's so much stuff to do. Like we need to finish Wabi Sabi. We need to have some lightning type integration. Uh, then obviously it would be nice to have a mobile wallet, a mobile uh, wallet for Wasabi. Yeah. So definitely there are so much work to be done and uh, so little human resources. Who knows um, Bitcoin? Who knows crypto? Who knows how to write code and so on? So yeah. And, and it seems that time is coming and, and it, it, it's knocking on the doors and, uh, and uh, people more and more demand will be for, uh, Bitcoin and, and using Bitcoin privately. So I just hope that by the time it arrives, I hope it arrives first and second, by the time it arrives, then we will be ready. Yeah. Well, so, so we got some motivation to uh, get back to work and be productive. <laughs> so, so each time we had a, we had a phenomenal conversation, um, uh, about all types of, of fascinating things in the Bitcoin privacy rabbit hole of the Lightning Network. Uh, is there anything that you would still like to point out as something that we maybe skipped over? Not really. I, I just want to encourage the viewers to, to read all these papers. Like, uh, I think these are the best sources of information about all this, all the topics we discussed. And, uh, like, I think Max, you are one of the best uh, educators. So in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So yeah, that, that's also my message to, to everyone that, uh, we need to educate ourselves and also to our uh, acquaintances and uh, family. So. Um, you know, um, that's, that's the only way, uh, so that's, that's the reason I like your work and your, uh, and Andrea's work, for example, or what Rene Picard does. I think it's, it's really important, uh, part of our mission that, um, yeah, we need to acknowledge that this is hard. This is complex topics. Um, and you cannot just solve, uh, privacy concerns by saying that, Lightning is fully private when it's not. So the reality is, is, is always complex and, and we need to educate first ourselves and then, and then, uh, everyone else. So feel free to have a look at the description of the video. And, uh, if you have any questions, reach out to Max, uh, Rene or any of the authors or me. And yeah, to the moon. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. With a, a lightning powered rocket, uh, we're going to go to the moon for sure. Um, Istvan, thanks, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it really was, was great talking to you and, and for sharing your insights so systematically and structuredly. Uh, very refreshing. Uh, and, uh, I, I think we did uncover quite, uh, quite a couple problems with today's Bitcoin lightning network. Um, and I do think that we are already talking about some compelling solutions on how to further improve it. Um, I don't think it's a lost cause. I actually think we have quite a promising future. But as you also pointed out, uh, it's not just going to magically appear. We actually have to build it with a lot of time, a lot of care, and a lot of effort. Uh, but thankfully, we have smart researchers like you and many others on board uh, who do a lot of great thinking on these lines. Uh, so thanks so much for, for all the work that you do uh, in your research. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really a pleasure to work with you. Thanks for having me in the show. And, uh, yeah, I really encourage the viewers, if you feel energy to contribute any to the open source project, or if you are a student, just write your master thesis or bachelor thesis, or just start a, a PhD in, in this field because there are so many open problems and, uh, there are so many interesting work to be done here. And, uh, you know, you, you, you do some great stuff and it will have automatically impact. So it's a really nice field to start any, any scientific work or, or just to contribute or if you're a developer. So 
would be nice, like, that would be really nice if someone just hears this and then uh, finds the motivation to contribute or work in this field. That would be, like, uh, super satisfying to hear and see. Yeah, and uh, thanks for having me to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, appears get active, start contributing to free software. Uh, that's the best message to end this show. So thanks very much for joining us here and see you on the next one. Bye bye. See ya.